you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, symposium. And uh, I'd like to say, as a Canadian, we always are non. Uh, we apologize in advance for anything that we say that uh, may insult anyone. It's uh, just our natural nature in Canada. So uh, I hope uh, there's nothing too controversial out of this. But I also like to thank. Uh, Jack Lifton for doing a very good job of summarizing my s presentation in advance, so. <laughs> anyway, one thing that I uh, wanted to point out is that RARES is not a mining business, it's a specialty chemical operation. 10 to 15 percent of the work in RARES happens at the mine site. The majority of the work happens subsequent to bringing the ore out of the ground. It's uh, in the processing where the value is created, the purity is done, and you get the specific final products that you need for the various applications. Also, RARES is uh, not unique, but it's very um, opaque industry. There is no London metal exchange like copper or gold or silver where you can actually find what the price is or there's a futures market to sell it. So you have to sell the finished products on a one-on-one -on -one basis to the uh, end user and that can take a long time which I know from uh, personal experience uh, trying to qualify lanthanum into the optical glass market in Japan was a period of five years um, so it's not a simple process uh, and some of these uh, applications particularly for automotive uh, and uh, some of the high-end applications do take a lot of time uh, to come to market and uh, final uh, sale. And as Jack pointed out earlier, no two deposits in the world are equal. Each one is unique. Uh, there are similarities, say, between Mount Weld and Mountain Pass in that they're bastnosite deposits, but each one you have to look at and, and develop a process flow sheet to address them independent of one another. So, um, you know, some of the other deposits around the world, such as Greenland, North Shar in uh, Sweden, uh, Kippawa in Canada, they're a, known as a eudiolite deposit. It's a very complex mineral and so far has not been done on a commercial scale basis. The applications, um, I think most people have heard about them in the press over the last, particularly the last two or three years. I remember uh, in 1995 uh, when I started in the rare earth business uh, trying to explain to people what rare earths were and what they were used for and it was very difficult to get anyone's attention for more than 30 seconds. Now you can talk to a taxi driver and he, he can tell you where all the rare earths are used and uh, it's very knowledgeable. When that happens it gets uh, quite scary actually because <laughs> but uh, the main there are four main areas that rares are used in magnets uh, wind turbines obviously hybrid vehicles and small motors your uh, small uh, digital camera would not be that small you couldn't do your auto focus auto zoom without the small uh, rare earth magnets that are in there um, and I've given you some of the elements here. Uh, again, Jack showed very well on the uh, periodic table where they are. And I uh, heeded uh, his comments as well. Once you put a periodic table up on there, it just shows that you're too much of an engineer, so you just leave it alone. Um, catalyst, there's three main areas for catalyst. Automobile catalyst, all your catalytic converters in the world use uh, cerium in uh, combination with zirconium uh, to convert uh, the NOx and, and CO2 into uh, non-toxic materials and they also add small amounts of neodymium, uh, praseodymium, various ones. The thing with automobile catalysts, each one is designed for the specific engine so each producer has its own uh, recipe and again it's a very customized business uh, the problem with selling into the automobile business is you get qualified today uh, 
for a car that will be built in 2016, 2017. So it's a, again, it's a very long process for sales, a very complicated, high technology uh, business, and there are very few companies in the world that actually are very active in this. FCC, uh, Fluid cat Cracking Catalyst, that is in the uh, petrochemical industry. Uh, the main use there is lanthanum, uh, and as Jack pointed out, three main uh, producers in uh, this industry. But without lanthanum, uh, they can work, but not as effectively. And last year, uh, you know, when lanthanum went from $10 a kilogram to $150 a kilogram, people started to uh, reevaluate uh, how much they really needed rares. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, you know. You can't talk about supply and demand without actually also looking at the price. Uh, there is some uh, price sensitivity, and other areas, um, you know, if you look at your Blackberry, the value of rares in there is possibly a dollar. Uh, if that goes from one dollar to a dollar and a half, it's really not going to change much in the final product. Uh, cost, but it's psychologically it's very difficult when prices are very volatile. Um, as part of Dasha, we went out and bought 22 million dollars worth of rares. That value increased to 150 million dollars in a period of 12 months. Actually, nine. Uh, that's now down to about 80. What people want in the rare earth industry as a user is a, a stable price. It may be high but as long as it's predictable because most of these people have to go out and make contracts with their uh, customers and commit to a certain price. And if you come back two weeks later and said, your price is now up another 10%, it just sends heart palpitations through the complete uh, supply chain. So people are, I think, more available to a higher price on certain applications, not all. Uh, and Syrian in the uh, glass polishing industry is a great example. Um, when cerium was $5 a kilogram, people never really paid much attention to it. They would change their tanks every two weeks and replace it with cheap cerium. When cerium went again to $150 a kilogram, people started to pay attention. Uh, they monitored the performance. They started to recycle so that the cerium they lose, used on the last polish step was then used again for the first polish step and consumption of cerium actually last year fell 65 percent in the glass polish industry because of the cost of the material. They also looked at using other materials other than rare earths so there are there is some substitutability of, of rare earths in certain applications as well. It's not um, guaranteed that you can survive with just rare earths. Um, also in the glass industry, it's uh, used for decolorization so that the glass uh, doesn't have any tint in it. And uh, also in high-end optics, uh, when I was growing up in um, Northern Ireland, I had British Health uh, glasses, which happened to be about the size of a uh, Coke bottle bottom. Um, now with the lanthanum, uh, I can wear a pair of glasses that look normal, which is always nice. Um, and phosphors. Um, there's a lot of uh, growing market in phosphors, uh, low energy light bulbs, your compact fluorescence, LEDs that are coming out now and will be a major part of the lighting industry in the future, and uh, LCD. Also your older CRT TVs uh, used uh, yttrium and europium to generate the red color. The number is 95-97% of the world supply happens from China. There is one operational plant outside of China right now in Estonia. Uh, Silmet is an old Russian plant. It is supplied from the Kola Peninsula. It generates about a thousand tons per year. But again, that's uh, only lanthanum cerium, neodymium, praseodymium. All the heavy rares come out of China. They have a Currently, what is a, a unique deposit, uh, the South China clays, which is uh, cerium is less than three or four percent. And as Jack pointed out, in typically in most of the other deposits around the world, cerium is 50 percent. Um, 
200 companies right now, 260. You know, there's a lot of people out there trying to get to the finish line on rares. Not many of them are going to make it. Maybe six, in my opinion. Uh, Linus and Molycorp obviously are, are most uh, advanced in the development of their projects. And again, uh, both of those projects, 75% of their deposit is cerium and lanthanum. Very little, if anything, uh, heavier than gadolinium is in the deposit. So they will not uh, address the need in the world for terbium, dysprosium, yttrium, um, and lutetium, which is other, another uh, very small volume, but highly uh, necessary material if you want to have a PET scanner. Um, and the problem right now is for heavy rares, there's nothing on the market that will come to fruition before 2015. So over the next three to four years, uh, China will be the only uh, viable source uh, for the critical materials uh, that Jack mentioned this morning. Key issues. Um, obviously in Malaysia, uh, the management of uh, thorium uranium um, is uh, a hot topic, uh, obviously. It can be managed, uh, in my opinion, safely, but and technology has changed, information has changed, uh, plants that were built uh, 20, 30 years ago, the knowledge base wasn't there as to the implications of uh, what would happen with some of the byproducts. Today, uh, you know, there is much more knowledge, much better monitoring, much better uh, measurement of what's going on, and I think uh, that's one of the issues that, that people are recognizing that you need to uh, manage carefully, uh, but it can be done. Uh, one thing in rares is balance. Uh, as you know, you get 15 elements in the back end of your plant, you get 15 elements out of the front end of your plant. Uh, trying to sell them in the same ratio that Mother Nature decided to uh, produce them is a challenge. Um, we had a factory in uh, North China that had a basketball court that was uh, four bags high, each bag one ton of lanthanum, and the basketball court was full. Uh, we finally got a contract at $2 a kilogram for that material, uh, which was great because uh, one, we were able to get the basketball court back for the employees, but two, we were basically turning a mountain into uh, cash. And that's the biggest challenge in the rare earth business is trying to find a way to balance your rares. Um, if you take the heavy rare earth deposits in South China, of those 15, you make money on six. Uh, if you're lucky, you break even on two or three, and the rest you throw back into the ground and wait for somebody to come up with a new application for them because it's just not worth um, doing anything with those materials at this point in time. The other challenge in rares is making sure that you don't come up with an application that is uh, more than the world can supply. I once talked with an automobile windshield uh, producer in America who wanted to put erbium into the uh, windshields. Nice thing about erbium, when you put it into glass at a certain level, it, it blocks the UV. So you had a way to keep the car cooler inside. It also gave it a nice uh, uh, tint. Problem was, um, we did some quick math, and if they even were able to penetrate five to 10% of the market with this technology, in three years they would have been uh, using double the world's capacity for erbium. So therefore, you know, it didn't really make a lot of economic sense to, to go down that path. Um, separation technology. China has been working at this uh, for 30, 40 years. Uh, Professor Yan can likely speak to it, obviously, much more eloquently than I can. But what China did uh, is change the game. Uh, they moved to a hydrochloric acid-based uh, process. Nitric uh, had been the standard in Japan and France prior to that. Nitric acid, the problem with nitric acid is you have to use stainless steel. Uh, and I remember from the early 90s in China f trying to find good stainless steel was a challenge. What they can do with hydrochloric acid is they can make 
solvent extraction separation units out of PVC, uh, which is very cheap material, readily available in China. Uh, when we expanded our plant inside China, we had people live on site and literally weld the cells together with soldering guns. Um, so it's a, a very inexpensive way uh, to put the uh, plant together, very cost effective. The other thing is that what most people focus on is digging the stuff out of the ground and separating it. But really, that's only half of the job. The key, when you especially get into the high quality end of rares, is the precipitation calcination. With this, you can uh, adjust the particle size, you can adjust the uh, surface area, you can adjust the quality. Uh, of the or lack of impurities that you want to address. For example, lanthanum that goes into the optical glass industry in Japan, you need less than one ppm iron. Traditional ways in uh, China it was five to seven ppm, so we had to learn how to purify the materials uh, so that you could get lanthanum that sold for six times the price of lanthanum that goes into FCC catalyst. So it's, uh, uh, again, a lot of work that needs to be done on the back end of the plant where you can bring the value uh, in particular to the high quality products. Uh, supply and demand forecast, that was one question that was asked. Uh, this again uh, is a, a quick look at supply and demand in 2015. This number keeps changing on a daily basis so uh, please don't quote me on these numbers. Uh, they come from a, a fairly reliable sh person, but as you can see, the thing is, cerium will be grossly in oversupply situation. The demand for cerium may even be less than those numbers, as the cerium polish market has uh, optimized its business. Uh, neodymium, basically in balance. Europium will be tight. Europium is the red activator. Uh, Typically, uh, for red color in lamps and TV screens, you use uh, six percent plus or minus two percent uh, europium in yttrium. Um, different countries like different shades of white. Uh, Americans tend to be more yellow, the Japanese tend to be more white or more reddish, so th the percent europium will move around. Terbium also will be tight. Terbium has two applications as noted. One is in uh, magnet industry, the other is in the green color in, in lighting where lanthanum, cerium, terbium are used together. Dysprosium, again, uh, as Jack mentioned earlier, that will be one of the keys. People in Japan are now working on optimizing the amount of dysprosium so that you don't have to use quite as much. Uh, but still, until 2015, uh, the only dysprosium that is going to come into the market will come out of China. Uh, they are trying to uh, conserve their deposits in the south. Uh, the problem in China is I don't think anybody really knows for sure how much is there. They keep finding a new deposit recently in Guangxi province, uh, but obviously uh, they want to uh, preserve some of that uh, for future uh, generations. And uh, this is actually uh, title is 2015, but it's actually 2020. This is from a, a Canadian uh, investment house, Byron Capital. Um, what they did is they took a look at what the demand would be at a certain price level, because that is what is critical. You can't just take uh, demand on its own based on projections, because demand will change depending on the price. Um, but as you can see, lanthanum be grossly, this is basically assuming Linus and Molycorp come online uh, at where they should be along with a couple of others. Uh, so there's going to be tremendous oversupply of cerium, tremendous oversupply of lanthanum. The implication there is lanthanum and cerium prices will just fall into the ground. Two, uh, you know, two dollars a kilogram, because basically you either sell it or watch it grow in your basketball court. So that's the, the two choices that you have. Neodymium, um, again, the demand depends uh, a little bit on price, but also on the application uh, growth, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Europium, again, uh, a lot will depend on the demand side on Europium as to how uh, quickly LEDs come in to replace some of the other lighting systems in the world. Terbium, again, 
seen as uh, in a good position and dysprosium in balance. So from Byron Capital's standpoint, uh, neodymium will be tight, dysprosium close, the others will be in, in basically an oversupply, again, depending on the price. As I just said, uh, light rares, there's not going to be anybody else coming to market unless they have a game-changing uh, economic position versus Linus and Molycorp. You know, Linus and Molycorp combined will bring on 62,000 tons of earth, rare earths. Bionobo in northern China was running 50,000 tons. So you know, they're doubling the supply. You can't run a factory just for neodymium or praseodymium. You have to sell some of the rest of it or hope that prices stay extremely high so that you can fill, backfill your mine with lanthanum and cerium. There has to be more work done on heavy rare earth deposits. Jack showed uh, quite a number of them around the world. As I say, the biggest challenge there is the metallurgy. Uh, no one has commercialized to any uh, large extent uh, anything other than bastnasite and monazite uh, outside of the South China clays. Uh, there are the Loperite deposit in Russia. They have a fantastic eudiolite deposit that is, you know, a billion tons. But again, the question is, can you process it economically? This is not build it and they will come. It's a question, can you build it and make money? Um, so there needs to be some more scale up on the heavy rare earth deposits uh, from that standpoint. As I said, pricing in cerium and lanthanum will rapidly decline. Uh, the minute Linus uh, throws its switch on, you know, China cannot consume all the cerium and lanthanum it produces. Uh, they have built, uh, in some words, a strategic inventory. Uh, I've talked to some people and they're saying that's a nice way of saying we're building an inventory that we can't sell. Um, so, you know, it depends on how you want to uh, put the wording around it. As I say, in uh, the prices for heavies escalated rapidly. Dysprosium went over 2,000 now, down closer to 1,000, 1,200. Things are beginning to level off now, uh, and I expect that they will stay in a more stable state over the next two or three years unless uh, demand rapidly increases again. Chinese advantages. In lights, they don't have a rare earth mine in Bionobo. They have an iron ore mine. Basically, the deposit is 80% iron ore, 20% rare earths. They mine for iron ore. The rare earths come out as a byproduct. The 20% of rare earths that they dig out of the ground, they only process uh, in the past about 25%. It possibly will go up to 30, 35%. The rest is put back into a tailings plant. They have a huge reserve just in tailings in Bionovo. Um, as said earlier, heavies, only South China is producing heavy rare earths for the next five years in that range. That will be their um, strength. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, people like Professor Yan did tremendous work in changing from uh, nitric acid to hydrochloric acid. And they understand rare earth chemistry better than anywhere else in the world. I think one of the things that's been lost, and Jack can attest to this, is we were talking last night, the US used to have knowledge on rare earth separation processing a whole bit. That generation is now gone. Uh, the Chinese, you can graduate with a degree in rare earth chemistry in China and they turn out very, very smart people there who understand the dynamics and kinetics of rare earth separation. Some of the things that they've learned recently is obviously how to process and improve the quality of that material. Um, and that, uh, but those are the Chinese advantages and they're very, the one thing I didn't put up here, very adaptable and they're very quick to learn. Uh, you know, we would spend a year developing a new product uh, for our company, AMR, and our competitors would be able to knock that off in three to six months. Uh, if we were lucky, we'd have two to three years uh, as a competitive advantage. So, you know, 
not to underestimate it, but I think it's also a potential uh, opportunity, as we discussed last night at dinner for the Malaysians, uh, is to develop that sort of knowledge. Uh, because people want to be not totally reliant on Chinese uh, cap capabilities, but also technology. And uh, one of the, the off-stream things is the Japanese have moved a lot of factories to China for reliability of supply. They don't want to have happen what happened when the Chinese trawler and the Japanese naval boat got in a bit of a, a bumping incident. Um, they want to be able to put their plants that use the rares close to a reliable supply. And they want to also put it in areas where uh, IP protection is, is very strong. Uh, at AMR, we built a neodymium iron boron uh, processing facility in Thailand because we wanted uh, to keep some of the technology uh, to ourselves. You know, there's an opportunity in Malaysia, I think, to bring processors of downstream products to the to the area and that will bring more value uh, obviously uh, Canada did a great job of exporting resources and buying back finished products uh, that's not that's not a long-term success uh, approach uh, but you know we're nice people we, we like to help others um, anyway I digress in Canada as Jack pointed out, there's a 43-101 national code. And it was brought in because of the problem in, in BREAX. Uh, and it's there to protect the invents, uh, investors and make sure that the information that's reported is uh, confirmed by an independent third party um, who is called a QP or Qualified Professional. The uh, I won't go through all of this, but environmental aspects are a key part of that. Um, and uh, a lot of studies are done for environmental impact, so that you can't basically dig anything out of the ground until some of the work has been done in advance. Um, whoop, whoops, I'm going backwards, pardon me. So, conclusion. Um, with Linus and Molycorp coming to market, there will be an impact on lanthanum and cerium prices. Um, there is no need for another light rare deposit in my mind unless it has tremendous uh, economics uh, involved with it. The key will be two or three heavy rare deposits coming to market outside of China. There's a number of them in the race right now uh, and each one has its pros and cons. Um, you know, the problem is these things really aren't, you can find rare earths in your backyard. If you went out at home, you dig it up, there'd be rare earths there, but it's not in a concentration that anybody can make any money at. Um, again, finding a jurisdiction for processing, that, that is important. Um, you know, and managing the byproducts properly is key. It can be done safely, uh, but you, you need to put the time and effort and the proper facilities and monitoring in place to make sure that it is stored in a proper manner. What will the response to the Chinese be? Um, one thing I've learned in 17 years going to China is never predict what the Chinese will do uh, because uh, you can guarantee to be wrong. But <laughs> They, um, they will do something. Rare earths is a, a strategic material inside China. Deng Xiaoping brought a, um, a message out that basically, uh, I think it was in the 80s, uh, the Saudis have oil and China has rare earths. Uh, that has elevated the rare earth industry within China to a quite unique level. It's not a big industry. Rare earths worldwide is three to four billion dollars of the intermediate product. It affects trillions of dollars of final products, but it's not a huge industry when you look at, as Jack pointed out, steel, copper, aluminum, all these other different materials in the world. It's not a large industry, but in the Chinese psyche, it is a very important industry. I've seen that quote from Dong Xiaoping on rare earth factory walls as you go into their lobby. Uh, so it is something that they hold near and dear to their heart and they will maintain a dominant position. It's just a question of, of how they react. Recycling is coming. Um, 
But it's not the solution. It's a part of the answer. Uh, Europe is beginning to recycle lamps for the phosphors. I believe uh, Rhodia and France will restart their uh, facility to do some of that lamp recycling. Japan is very active in that, but you're not going to collect a million blackberries and extract the rares out of it because it's just not worth your time. But batteries, uh, large magnets for wind turbines, you know, those sort of things. But some of that, you know, is five or ten years down the road when the uh, magnets start to wear out or the Prius uh, starts to rust. So it is part of the solution, but not uh, the total answer. And also the long term economics, as I said, you know, the demand. F Ferreras is totally, not totally dependent on the price, but it has a significant impact. The other thing is technology development. Rares traditionally every decade has come up with a new application. Uh, yttrium europium for red phosphorus, samarium cobalt, then neodymium iron boron, uh, the catalytic converter. It's been 20 or 30 years since a major application has actually been developed for rares, and so I think as the supply becomes more available and pricing becomes more stable, obviously work with the, the universities to develop applications that traditionally had not been explored uh, is an area that even Malaysia, I think, could get uh, involved with because you'll have a plant next door that uh, will be able to work with you and, and I think that's, uh, again, another opportunity in the Malaysian market. But I think my time is up. Uh, I appreciate your attention and uh, look forward to this uh, afternoon's uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>